Hi, hello. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> cool. Uh, so, hello. How are you guys doing? You guys having fun? Uh, show me your hands if you're having fun, just so I can see. Okay, cool. Perfect. Uh, I, I know I'm having fun. Uh, before I get started with my talk, I'd like to say a few words. Um, you know, it's been so fun to be here uh, these days. You know, like, I'd like to show thanks uh, the conference organizers, uh, you know, uh, great job, guys. Uh, you know, great speakers, uh, great venue, and you know, amazing people to talk with. You know, like uh, it's been great to talk, to share, you know, knowledge with you guys. Uh, yeah, thanks for attending my talk as well. Right? Uh, yes, as I said, for the next 40 minutes, I will be talking about uh, how and why I learned Go. Uh, I'm a Ruby developer. I've been working with Ruby. Actually, I've been working with software development for the last 90 years. Uh, that gave me the chance to work with many technologies and all sorts of projects. Um, I had the chance to work with, with JavaScript, work with Python, work with Java, and you know, like Visual Fox Pro, you know, if you are one of the old guys, Visual Fox Pro. Uh, and and then since I started to, you know, since I changed jobs, I, I had to learn Go because one of the things we do there, uh, you know, it has uh, a strong non-functional requirement, and that strong non-functional requirement, it is, it has to be resilient. It should be, you know, up and running, you know, for most of the time at least, you know. And I'll be sharing a little bit about that, right? So a little bit about me. Uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Kleber. I probably told that already. <laughs> uh, you can find me at the social networks as Kleber Virgilio, you know, GitHub and Twitter. Um, I work for Globe.com. Uh, it's a great place to work. <laughs> if you are looking for a job, we have, you know, if you're looking for a job and also cool challenge, you know, we have plenty for you. Just come talk to us. You know, we have uh, like a gang here and also like pretty cool gifts. So if you want some, let's talk and then I'll give you one or two or maybe all of them. <laughs> cool. Uh, disclaimer. Uh, this talk is not about bad mouthing Ruby, right? Like I'm not going to stand here saying, "Oh, well, Ruby don't scale," uh, blah blah blah. No, it's, I actually love Ruby. Ruby is the language that makes sense to me. I do most of the, my work in Ruby, but no, not, not for the last six months. Uh, but it is more about you know, like comparing how the two languages approach problems and how they can be different, right? Uh, you know. All languages have, you know, like variables and types and, you know, if and else's and force. But, you know, we, I want to show you, you know, how you need to change your mind to work with Go, right? So the agenda, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Go's purpose. Um, and, and then I'm, show, I'm going to show you a few Go tools so you can get started with. And then we are going to compare Ruby to Go. Again, it's not about syntax, it's more about mindset, right? Uh, and then by the end of the talk, I plan to draw some conclusions, and that might be a little biased, you know? It's in my opinion, but hopefully you agree with me, right? Next. Okay, so Go development started in 2007. Uh, in 2009, it was open sourced, and then in 2012, uh, it was formally released you know, to the public, so we could use it. Uh, Go has... On GitHub, Go has uh, uh, GitHub Go has more than 32,000 stars and also almost a thousand contributors, right? So, yeah, Go it's it's been you know under heavy development for the last you know since 2007, uh, and also Go has been largely adopted for big players out there, right? Like companies like YouTube, Globe.com, Netflix, Let's Encrypt, you know. They are all looking at Go with you know that you know that you know with that in mind you know like uh, trying to leverage what the language can you know, bring to the table when you are coding with Go, right? But why was Go created, right? If that's a good question for us today, right? Like you do whatever you do in your language, so why should you you know pay attention to Go, right? Why should you care about Go? Uh, so. Rob Pike, one of the creators of Go, he wrote an uh, excellent article explaining how, Go, how Google uses Go. And 
which kind of problems they were having that they had to create a new language despite of all the options we have today. So let's just see a few of those problems and then let you know discuss about it about them. One of the problems uh, Harb Pikes mentions in the article it is slow builds. That is actually a joke that people will often tell you that Go was actually created while they were waiting for a long build to you know to happen to finish, and and then like he says in the article that li large programs. Uh, can take even like 45 minutes to, you know, to complete like the compilation, and that's too much because Google has you know massive computers and you know like all sort of clusters to distribute the compilation of the code, and he explained that in the article, but that's a problem he's trying to 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 solve with GoLang, and control dependencies. Uh, that's a good thing to to talk a little bit. Uh, even you know, uh, sometimes we just require and require and require gens on our projects. Or if you do Python, you import you know packages, and you know you, we need to be careful about that. You know, like there was a case in, at Google that a large program with 2,000 files, uh, those files concatenated together. The size of those, those files concatenated together was five megabytes, but then. When we, but then when we included the dependencies, uh, the size of the file increased to eight gigabytes. You know, I'm not a compiler expert, but I'm pretty sure that makes things harder to the compiler, right? Uh, moving on, uh, one of the other problems, uh, he's, you know, he mentions in the article, it is. Even at Google, that has you know outstanding, outstanding engineers and brilliant minds, though they were struggling with uh, poorly documented code and code hard to understand and hard to read, right? Uh, so you know you don't need to be a genius to to uh, to you know, to conclude to conclude that these will lead to expensive updates, right? So if you don't understand code, you know, the code you are working on, it's probably going to be, you know, it's probably going to take, you know, a long time to, to you know, to change or to fix something or to implement a new feature. Uh, he also mentions that he feel like uh, languages like we have today or languages Google has, you know, available or they were, you know, uh, they, they, he feels like the lack of uh, modern features in that in those languages, right? And by modern features, uh, I mean language uh, should be easy to compile between, you know, across many platforms, um, and also it should have concurrency as a building feature of the language, right? It shouldn't be hard to do that, right? <laughs> But you know, I was thinking when I was reading the article, I was thinking, well, well, I don't, I kind of don't agree with him because I think like we have you know plenty of languages that you know solve that well, right? Uh, and then I wrote like <laughs> his code, right? Like I would just read here because I I want you to, to you to understand that better. Uh, the concurrency landscape today is almost. Uh, unrelated to the environment in which the language being used, mostly C++, Java, and Python, have been created. The problems introduced by, by, by multi-core processors, network systems, and massive computa computation clusters weren't addressed. So that, you know, those are, you know, his words. And, you know, I, I need to agree, right? Like, so, you know, he, th he says that, the problems are being worked around and not actually solved, right? And hopefully we can understand that better. So a little bit, you know, them, a little bit about uh, the minds behind Go. Um, from the left to the right, we have Rob, Rob Grishammer, uh, Rob Pike, and Ken Thompson. You know, if you know a little bit about computer science, or you know, if you've read, if you have had, if you had read books you know, about computer science, you probably heard those names, right? They are responsible for those technologies, like uh, Ken Thompson created B, which became the, uh, then became the, the language C. So if you do Ruby, if you do Node, you probably are using a little bit of C. Uh, 
He, he also created Unix. So if you deploy your code in a, Linux, in a Linux machine or if you use a Mac, you are using some of his work. He also is responsible for unpacking and packing UTF-8, right? Like, that is like a whole history behind it, but he uses, he's like, he come up with the code to unpack and pack uh, the UTF-8 standards like in one night, you know? So he's brilliant. <laughs> uh, Rob, uh, Robert Grishammer, he created, he worked in the team that developed uh, the Chrome JavaScript engine and also the JVM. So yeah, I think that's enough, you know, just so we know, you know, the kind of minds we have behind Go, right? But that's enough, let's see some code, right? Uh, the idea here is to show you the basics and then we are going to solve a real world problem together. And I'm going to be showing a lot of code, so be prepared. So typically, uh, Go developers, uh, you know, they work in a workspace. That's a little bit different for, for us because we do not, you know, Ruby developers or even Python developers or JavaScript developers, we do not that have that concept, right? Like, we do not work, we do not put all our code in the same place, right? Like, so typically, Go developers will do that. And Go will look for the Go path environment variable to find that workspace, right? So you need to set that environment variable, and that vi environment variable should point to your workspace. That's how a hello world in Go looks like. It's pretty simple. Uh, you, know, you can read, like, right? You can understand. And then that's how we install it. So you need, so you need to go through a process you know, before you see your code running, right? So you need to build your code, and then you need to run your code. So go install is those two tasks together. So go install will, build, for, will build, build first your code, and then it will put your binary in the go path uh, bean folder, right? So what a workspace looks like. So that's how a workspace looks like, right? Uh, in the workspace, you are going to find three folders, three directories, and they are the bean folder, the package folder and the source folder. The bean folder is where Go will put your binaries, as I said. The package folder, it's where Go will put the compilation of your packages. So when you do Go install, Go will actually compile your package and then place your packages in there. And the source folder, it is where your code goes, right? It is where your code leaves, right? Uh, a little bit about uh, the learning curve and you know, about Go, like, uh, Go has only 25 keywords, so it's not that hard to, to, to learn, right? Uh, you only need to know what those keywords does and then put them together, right? Like, and create your, your software, your programs. And then if we, as opposed to Ruby, you know, uh, Ruby has almost twice as much as Go has. So Ruby has 40, you know, 40, 41 keywords. So I'm not saying Ruby is it's harder to read or to understand or, you know, I'm just saying it has more, right? Like you need to learn more. You need to, to put more energy in learning Ruby. Okay, talk's cheap. Let's, uh, let's see some code. Uh, when you start a new Ruby project, you often will pick uh, a Ruby version manager, like RVM, like RBAMF, you know. Go has a thing, uh, you know, Go has a tool that's similar to that. It's called Gimme. And Gimme will allow you to have more than one version of Go installed in your machine. And also, it will make things easier for you to compile the language, right? Um, in, in S, in Node.js, we have Yarn or NPN, or in Python, we have pip. In Ruby, we have Bundler, and in Go, we have DAP, right? Like, every time you need to go, and so Bundler is, sorry, but Bundler is basically a dependency manager, right? But when you need to download some code from a remote repo story, right? The way you do that in Ruby, you do gen-install Bundler, and then that will go and fetch your package, your package, your gen. Uh, and in Go, we can do the same thing by doing Go get, right? And then when you pass the flag U, the flag U will actually go and get. And if you already have that in your installed in your workspace, it will actually update your project, right? 
So as I, as I was saying, like uh, Ruby has Bundler, and Bundler, Bundler it's the tool that manages your dependencies. Uh, so when you run Bundle init, you are going to generate two files, and those two files are gen file and gen lock. And of course, you know that like gen file, it's the gen file is where you declare your dependencies, and the gen lock, it's your it's it's the tree of your dependencies actually locked by version, right? Uh, Go has a similar tool, you know, Go has an official tool, right? Like this year, Go released an, an official tool for that. It's called DEP. Before that, you know, we didn't have an, an official tool to manage our packages in Go. So now we have the Go, the, the DEP. Uh, and we can do the same thing with DEP, you know, just by, you know, running the common DEP init, right? And DEP init will generate for you two files. Uh, the first one is Go Package Tomel, which is where you declare your dependencies. And the second one is Go Package Lock, which is where it's going to be a lock version, a locked version of our dependencies with you know, versions and uh, hierarchy and all those things, right? And then to install dependencies, you finally run bundle install. It's the same thing, you know, like you done, you run npm install or pip install for Python. Uh, we have the same the same thing in Go would be dep ensure. Um, dep ensure will actually do a little, one thing more than bundle does. Dep ensure will actually look into your code and find your imports, right? Like it, will, it will resolve your imports and you know and make a sync. Well. I do have that dependency installed in my machine. I don't need to go and fat that. Well, that one I do not have, but he didn't declare that yet. So what should I do? I will go and fat that and put it in the, in the, in the vendor folder, right? So uh, the way Go f looks for dependencies, it's, it's pretty simple. He goes in your workspace, and then he will look for the depends there, dependencies there. But he will also he he will look first in the vendor directory in your project, like right. Like if you have a vendor directory in your project, go you look at that vendor director directory, and if your vendor if your package is there, he doesn't need to go all the way to the workspace. Okay, so we have been talking a lot about packages. Let's see how we can use them. Uh, when importing packages from the standard library, you don't need to provide the full name of the package. You can just give a short, you know, a short name, and the short name it is, you know, and Go does that because that way he can, you know, Go can avoid uh, collision, right? Uh, co collision between names. And if you are importing a third-party package, uh, you need to provide the full name. You know, like you need to provide the repository, the username, and then the name of the package, the name of the package you want to use. Types. I'm not, I'm not going to spend too much time here. Uh, you know, as any other language, you will find all types you need to write your applications: uh, boolean, string, integer, numbers, whatever. Um, and then variables. Uh, variables. It's 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 a little bit different, at least uh, f you know, for us people that does dynamic language, right? Like if you do JavaScript, Python, or Ruby, you are not used to let the compiler know the type of your variable, right? Like you kind of you know skip that part because you know the the, the runtime will do that for you, right? Ruby doesn't have a compiler. <laughs> uh, okay, so the first thing we need to notice here it's like at the first line. Uh, you can see I'm declaring a variable, and that variable has it starts with uppercase a letter, right? And what does does that do, right? Like what that's doing it is exporting your variable, right? That's actually doing two things. The first one it is exporting your variable. So when you declare anything with uh, a uppercase letter, that will export, you know, that thing to all packages around it. So Everything will have access. Everyone will, ha will have access to that variable, or function, or method, and everyone can change it. So you know, like everyone has like full access. You know, read and write. Uh, when you declare, like in the first line, at when you declare a variable without you know assigning a value to to the variable, that variable will assume uh, the zero value. And what is the zero value for for a string? The zero value it is a, a empty string. Uh, for an integer, the zero value it is the number zero, and for a boolean, the zero value it is uh, false, right? Like it's just false. And for all the, you know, as far as I know, for all the other types, 
uh, the zero value is actually new. And that's, you know, you're going to figure out that by yourself, right? But that's how you can declare, you know, at least five ways to declare a variable in Go. <laughs> so class, is Go an object-oriented language? You know, I took that from, you know, the documentation, the Go's documentation, and they say yes and no, right? Like, you know, you kind of, you can do object-oriented oriented style programming in Go, but, you know, you are not going to have features like inheritance, uh, method overloading, uh, overwriting methods, and all these kind of met, you know, things that you, you gain when you are coding in object-oriented language. Uh, so in Go, I structured the closest is the closest thing you have to a class. So I will just you know read you know very slowly what we are doing at the top of the, the slide. So we are defining a type, and that type call is called status. And as you can see, that type it is exported to all other packages. And then that type has uh, it is like relying on a struct behind the scenes. So that type it is pointing to a struct behind the scenes, right? Uh, that type has two attributes, and you know, like it is a status and it is a boolean, and then message it is a is a string. Like, you know, that's you know, it's a little bit, you know, if you look at the bottom of the slide, it's it, it's something like that in Ruby, right? Like so. Both status and message they are exported as well, and then and then they are exit. You know they have people. Are, no, not people, but like packages outside the package has full access to, you know, those attributes, and then then they can initialize or then they can set values and do everything, right? So go does so Ruby. That's how we do inheritance of Ruby, right? Like it's. Just like that, pretty simple. You know, you have your parent class, and then you want to specialize that parent class, so you create a new class that inherits from par from, from from your parent class, right? So the way we do that in in Go, it is composing structs, stru structs, right? Uh, by composing structs, you can achieve something similar to inheritance in Ruby, but it's not really like you know inheritance uh, so as you guys can see here I have the health check struct and then I have a mongo health check struct that embeds uh, the health check struct so that's basically the same not the same thing but you know something similar uh, and then uh, in Go, uh, Go structs doesn't have a constructor method, right? Like, if you want to, if you want to have some kind of standard to initialize your your structs, you need to follow a convention, and by convention, the constructor method should be called new, right? Just new. Uh, and then, but like in our example, I'm actually defining a new Mongo health check, and then new Redis health check, right? And then. Uh, that's you know in, in, in pink you know uh, you guys can see how you need to initialize a composed object. It's it's you know it's a little bit verbose, but that's the way you, we do right. Like you initialize first the compo the embedded struct by passing an attribute by passing you know like what it needs to be initialized, and then that instance we will initialize the Mongo health check. So yes, I I think it is a, a little bit a little bit verbose, but yeah. That's the way you should do. So methods, uh, methods and functions. Let's just understand the difference between them. Oh well. Okay. Okay. Functions are first class citizen in, in the GoLang, right? Like you can receive it as a parameter. You can return it. Um, and function, you know, and functions can also. Uh, uh, return, you know, more than one value at the same time. So I will just read like what we have in the screen. So we are defining a function called duration, and then function called duration, it is expecting a function as an attribute, and then that function, you know, that function is actually saying, I'm going to return, if you call me, I will return to you two objects. The first two one is a time duration, and the second is an error. So that's, it's, it's a, a a very, a very frequently used idiom in Ruby, right? Like, in Ruby, if you have a f in Go, sorry, in Go, if you have a function that somehow can, you know, generate an error, you normally return it to to the caller, right? You do not try to 
you, well, sometimes you can, but it's it's often the, the way you do it with the, the way you deal with that is returning it to the caller, right? And then that's a method. So let me just read for you. We are defining a method called timeout in the health check structure. Structure. Um, so as you can see, it's a little bit different, right? Like we we are calling func, which is a keyword, and then we are specifying the receiver of that function. So, you know, that function, it's, it's going to be binded to, to, it's going to be bound to that, that uh, struct, right? So from now on, all instances of health check respond to the method timeout. And then the method timeout will follow the same, you know, rules, right, as a function does. The only difference is a method is supposed to Methods are supposed to be behavior, right? Like, they're supposed to, to deal with data, you know, like the data of the object that method exists, right? Uh, while this function are supposed to be not side of, not, you know, are supposed to be just like a function that receives argument and do uh, anything with that argument and then return something. Okay, interfaces, right? Like, uh, that's a thing we don't have in Ruby, uh, but if you are used to, you know, uh, statically type of the language, you do that a lot. Um, so what is an interface? An interface is a contract, right? That you have like a list of methods, and if you want to implement that interface, you need to to fulfill that contract. And to fulfill that con contract, you need to implement those methods, the methods listed in the interface. Uh, so I like to think that an interface it's something close to duck typing in Ruby, right? So if it walks like a, uh, a duck and quacks like a duck, it, it is a duck, right? Uh, so that's way, the way I see. Maybe you don't agree with me. But you know, uh, at the bottom of the slide, uh, I'm implementing an interface. And the way you implement an interface in Go, it is just implementing the method. So if, a object has, if an object has a status, that object is going to be a status error. Right. Uh, one thing, you know, by convention, when you have an interface that has only one method, uh, what you need to do, you need to call the name of that interface should be the name of the method with or at the end, right? And that, that's why we have a status or interface. For an if, I'm not going to explain for you what is a for and what is a if. I'm just going to say that in, in Go, we do not have while each loop until, you know, uh, up to, down to, we don't have this kind of loops in Go, right? The only thing we have is four, and you can achieve, you know, everything with four, like, you know, everything Ruby does with all sorts of loops in four, with four. And also, Ruby, uh, Go has this weird uh, pre-statement in, in if statements, where you can actually do something and define even a variable there, and that variable will be available in the, constants, in the context of the for, right? in the context of the if, right? Like, yeah, I think that, yeah, that's good. Exceptions, uh, go do not implement exceptions, uh, you know, according to the documentation, they think, you know, try, you know, when you, you try to use try, cat, and finally, or in our case, rescue, it's a little bit overwhelming. So they do not uh, implement exceptions. The way they do, it is like, you should, be, you should be the one responsible to manage and handle your errors. So that's basically how it's, it's done in, in Go, right? Everything you do that can return an error, you know, as you can see, like, I'm, you know, getting the, the errors, and then I'm always checking if the error is different than new, right? Like, because the zero value of an error, it's new. And then if it is different than new, I need to do something, right? Like, I need to act, right? OK, with that said, uh, I want to introduce you a real world problem that I had to work on Globe.com recently. And on Globe.com, Globe uh, we strive to be resilient, right? Like, we say that uh, the thing that's most important for us, you know, it's that our users, they do not, you know, realize that we are having some problems on, uh, on our end, right? Like, we want that their experience to be the best, you know, and we do everything we can to, to be resilient, right? So I'm working this application, and that application has one job. It's to stay up and running, you know? Doesn't matter if 
if the dependencies of that application is not doing well, we need to stay up and running. And then at the sign off, you know, if something can go wrong, we need to, to know about it like before it happens. So in order to do that, we work closely with, you know, other teams and the solution we came up with is like, let's expose uh, an endpoint in that application. And that endpoint is going to be called health check. And every time our automated tools, you know, request that endpoint, uh, we are supposed to see the word working if everything is okay. Otherwise, we shouldn't see the word working, right? So it, it's something like that. We have the web application, and then the web application has dependencies. And I'm just listing two of them, but it has much more than two. And every time you reach the, the endpoint, you should see the word working if it is everything working fine. Otherwise, you should see, you know, the first, you should see the first service that is, it is having a problem, right? So not that you should see the first service that it is having a problem. It's more that you shouldn't see the, the word working. So as you guys can see here, uh, uh, there is two differences. There is two times here. Uh, I, I expose two, two you know, for the sake of example here, I expose two endpoints. The first endpoint it is the health check, and the second endpoint it is the parallel health check. So yeah, that's just so I can show you how we can do, you know, instead of going, you know, through the services like one by one asking, are you okay? Okay, cool. Uh, we are going, to, you know, like all of them at the same time, and then if they respond they are not okay, I'm just, you know, uh, saying to the world, okay, we are not okay, let's do something. We need to react to that. Uh, okay, if you want to see the code, you, just, you can just go to those URLs. It's, that is like a room implementation of the same code and a Go implementation of the same code. Uh, okay, so that's how our program looks like, right? Like that's the tree of our program. So if you look at the pink square, you will see that we have a package called help check and we have the main sorry we have the main we have the main go file which is where our binary is supposed to be our executable is supposed to be okay cool that's the main file and on the top of the main file we, do, we are defining the package and um, you know if you have executables, if you are going to generate binaries in Go, you know, the recommendation is those binaries should be in the main file, in the main package at least, sorry. Uh, and then here we are importing them. So, you know, the same thing that I said, like we import some standard library, uh, you know, packages and also the package we are just working right now, right? And then we are just, you know, like spinning up uh, uh, a web server. That's pretty much, that looks very similar to, to Node, right? Like, at least I think. And then if you can see, we are exposing there like two, two endpoints. And the first endpoint, it is, it is we are, you know, uh, binding to that endpoint like the, the handler function. And in, in the second one, we are binding the parallel handler function. Okay, so that's our handler, right? Like, uh, the thing I want you to pay attention here, it's like our handler is calling uh, vital services, uh, get vital services, but, uh, you know, those are our vital services, uh, Mongo Health Check and Redis Health Check. So, you know, when you define an array in Go, you cannot, uh, you will, Go doesn't have generics, right? Like, you cannot put two kind of objects in the same array, right? Like, that's like, that's, we're not compile. How would you do that, you know? You cannot do something like that. You cannot have an array and put two, you know, different objects in, in it, right? How would you solve that problem? Right? Uh, you know, the way to solve that problem is just as, you know, I told you, uh, we can use interface, right? Like, uh, so that's how you can approach this kind of problem. When you need to have uh, different objects in the same structure, in the same, you know, data in the same type, um, you just need to define that that type it is it is from a, a, a interface, right? So that way you can achieve uh, polymorphism, right? And then now we are good to go. 
Now our uh, run health check it is actually receiving the services in all of them and not just one. Um, and cool. And then that's you know it's it's really it's, sim it's simple like that. We are just like iterating over the services and then calling status and then you know if it is everything okay, we do not you know the if we fail, the if we will not you know uh, be executed and we will return a double uh, return. Otherwise, we are going to return the, the status and the error to the caller. And then we are going to check, right? <laughs> if the error is not new, if the error is actually equal new, <laughs> sorry, okay. If the, if the error is actually equal new, uh, we are going to write that in the response. Um, okay. And then let's just see the difference and as if you, you know, in here, we are going you know, one by one and not all of them at the same time. Uh, but let's just you know, take a look at how we can go in all of them at the same time, right? Like how we can leverage Go Concurrence to go in all of them at the same time. So that's, uh, it is our handler that goes in all of the services at, at the same time. Uh, one important thing here, like, in Go, uh, we have channels, and if you watched the talk yesterday about Go Concurrence, you learned that channels are blocking queues, uh, and, blocking, and you can write to those channels, and then when you need to read from that channel, uh, you know, it, it will stop in that line, and it will not go ahead, you know, with your code. So we are getting the services, and then we are calling the function that does the health check that, run, the, the, that runs the health check in parallel, and then we are sending those channels to, do, to that function, right? So can you see the, the differences here? Like, apart from receiving the channels, that's the difference between them. That one runs in parallel, that one runs one by one, right? It is just the Go word, the Go keyword, right? Uh, if you just put the Go keyword, uh, you know, on, in front of your uh, function, it will execute the, the function in parallel, right? It's actually spawning a Go routine. Yeah, just the Go, the Go keyword. And then, if you remember, in here we have a four, and then. That for is just a while, an infinite loop. Uh, and then if you remember that I told you, uh, we are using selection case. Because when we, we try to read from the channel, uh, in, the first in the first case, uh, we are actually trying to read from the channel. That's the notation to read from the channel, right? Like an, an arrow. Uh, you know, it will, be there, it will be stopped there until someone writes to that channel, right? And then if someone writes to that channel, we are just going to fail quickly. Or you know, just going to write the response that we are not good, we're not doing well. Just send the message to whoever is pay attention to that. Or in the other case, in the health case, uh, we are going to receive the health signs, that receive the health messages, and then we are going just to make sure that all the services are you know, doing okay. If all the services are doing okay, we are going to write working the response. And that's how you are going to see the response, right? like half of the time, and because they went in, like in parallel to all the services. But then, how do you uh, deploy that? You know, like how, you know, if you are working something like that, you need to deploy your code, right? Like we are creating this, the, you know, the, everything like in, in a macOS operating system, which is a free BSD, but we we want to deploy that code in a Linux in a Linux machine, right? In Go, you can just like, you know, as I told you, like one of the problems that Go is trying to solve, it's like, it should be easy to compile across different platforms. So that's the way we compile our code uh, to a different platform. Like in that case, a Linux uh, operating system. And then there we generate for us a binary. And that's, it's all your program, right? Like you don't need, like you, you have no more files, just that one. It's everything in there, the server, the health checks, it's everything in there. And then it is that binary that you need to send to the, to the server. And then if I try to run that binary on my machine, on my Mac OS, it's not going to work because uh, we, build, we build it to, to run on a Linux machine and not in a free BSD machine. 
but okay, too much. But then, like, I'm here. I'm just using Docker to simulate how can I how I can run uh, my binary in a Linux VM in a Linux container, right? Like, and then you you see like you know at the bottom of the slide that is listening on port 4040. 4040. So that means it is working. <laughs> it is working fine. Right. So <laughs> conclusions. Finally, so. Um, Learning Go is not about the correct uh, learning synthesis, right? Like it's not about you know, like learning a new language, like uh, in idiom, like you just learn words, right? Like you really need to learn how to approach problems, how to solve problems in the Go way, right? Uh, you need to be aware that Go was created to solve Google's problem, and not most of the problems we have, you know, on our, you know, on small companies or small applications. So you know, choose wisely if you are going to go with Go for your next. Project, but like if you think you look somehow like Google, go for it. Uh, even though concurrence it's simple to be done in Go, you know, be careful, right? Like you can go to really edgy cases that it can be hard for you to debug your code and understand what's going on. So choose wisely. And I think it is quite verbose. <laughs> uh, his source, uh, you know, my talk will be available later in the speak deck. So yeah, that's all. Thanks. Thank you.